No man can serve two masters. You cannot serve God and mammon. Words taken from St. Matthew's Holy Gospel. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. The Merchant of Venice is considered one of Shakespeare's most famous plays. In a nutshell, the play is about a man named Antonio, who was a merchant from the Italian city-state of Venice. Antonio is a very joyful man who is always most generous, often lending money to his friends without ever charging any interest. As the play begins, one of Antonio's friends is desperately in need of a loan. And since Antonio has most of his money tied up in investments, he suggests that his friend get a loan from the local moneylender named Shylock. The Jewish character named Shylock practices something called usury, where he seeks to unlawfully gain profit through the lending of money. Shylock serves mammon, not God. Antonio, who provides interest-free loans, and Shylock, who is nothing but a loan shark, despise each other. Now Shylock agrees to provide a loan to Antonio's friend, but if the loan should go unpaid, Shylock demands that he be entitled to a pound of Antonio's own flesh as payment. Thinking that his investments will bear much fruit, Antonio agrees to this gruesome condition. Later on in the play, Antonio finds that all of the trading ships that he invested in may have sunk in the sea. Antonio seems to be in financial straits, and the loan is due. The cruel usurer Shylock will accept nothing but a pound of flesh from Antonio as payment. But it is only through that clever woman named Portia that Antonio was saved from this violent loss of his own flesh. Using a logical argument in court, Portia, dressed and disguised as a lawyer, states that Shylock can have a pound of flesh from Antonio, but that he must do it without causing the person Antonio to bleed. For the contract stated that Shylock was entitled only to flesh, but not to Antonio's blood. The play ends upon a joyous celebration with Antonio being set free and even Antonio's trading ships returning almost miraculously to the port of harbor. This Shakespearean play has had great influence on Western society, including adding words or phrases literally to our vocabulary. The name of that usurious moneylender, Shylock, for example, has become synonymous with a loan shark, or one who does not invest in productive ventures, but rather simply lends money to those who are in need, and he wants to seek a profit on top of that. Pound of flesh has also entered into our vocabulary as a slang for a very unpleasant debt that is owed. But the Merchant of Venice also brings up a topic of the evil and unjust practice of usury, which is not only condemned by sacred scripture and sacred tradition, but is also against the natural law itself. Let's consider an example. A member of the working class, the working poor, borrows $300 from modern-day Shylock firm, also known as payday lenders. After only six months, major fees accrue until the person ends up paying the usurious company $1,200 of wealth for the borrowing and using of only $300. Stories like this are actually very common in our present economic system, especially with the notion of what is called compound interest, which can increase profits and gain for usurers. Simple interest, for example, is only based on the principal amount of the loan, while compound interest is based on the principal amount of the loan and the accumulated interest on top of that. The act of declaring that somehow this interest is part of the initial loan itself is called compounding. Quick example. If you borrowed $2 at the time of Christ's birth at a 3% annual interest rate, after 2,000 years today, 
you would end up owing $122 in interest. But calculating the exact same figures using compound interest, however, brings far higher results. Again, borrowing $2 at the time of Christ's birth with a 3% annual interest rate, but this time compounded. After a period of just 1,000 years, there would be $20 trillion in interest owed. That's a lot of mammon. Consider this observation made by an economist. If the U.S. economy grows on average between 1.5% and 2% each year, which seems to be the average lately, and the interest that lenders charge even to governments is higher, say 3 or 4%, it is a mathematical fact that the wealth of those who lend money will make them much wealthier than society as a whole. And since lenders are typically of the wealthy class as opposed to the poor, usury always guarantees that the rich will always get richer and the poor will always get poorer. Because usury concentrates wealth into the hands of a few to the point that many have little or nothing, and so a welfare state has to be instituted to assist the poor. In other words, those in need of wealth, the poor, are required through usury to transfer the little funds they have to those with the greatest wealth, the usurers. And furthermore, usury often diverts real investment, which is good, away from productive activities such as manufacturing and farming because various money lenders can more easily gain greater wealth using usury, issuing non-productive loans where profit and gain is made on the loan itself. Now, the church's teaching, which is rarely spoken of today, the church's teaching against usury has been infallibly defined and confirmed over and over again, but especially in the papal letter by Pope Benedict XIV, known as Vix Pervenit. In that papal encyclical, the Pope stated, quote, The nature of the sin, called usury, has its proper place and its origin in a loan contract, which demands by its very nature that one return to another only as much as he has received. The Pope continues, the sin rests on the fact that sometimes the creditor, the lender, desires more than he is given. But any gain which exceeds the amount he gave is illicit, illegal, and usurious, unquote. The lender always has the right to be made whole, to be compensated for the services and also the effects of inflation but he is not allowed to take a direct profit or gain upon the loan itself. Now, it must be admitted that many theologians today and virtually all modern Catholics, including most bishops and priests, would say that only excessive interest rates are usury and immoral. But such a conclusion would be false. For usury in the past meant the charging of any unjust interest on a loan simply by virtue of a loan contract, that is, without any other justifying cause except that the money is being loaned. Again, we refer to that same encyclical of Pope Benedict the Fourteenth, where he taught, quote, one cannot condone the sin of usury by arguing that the gain is not great or excessive, but rather moderate and small. And neither can it be condoned by arguing that the borrower is somehow rich, nor even by arguing that the money borrowed is not left idle, but is spent usefully, unquote. Again, usury is condemned. Ancient pagan thinkers like Plato, Aristotle, Seneca, all condemned usury. The ancient Jews, true Christians, including all church fathers, ecumenical councils, Many popes, countless doctors and saints, and even Muslims have always condemned usury or unjust interest on a loan for the purpose of making profit and gain. The Holy Bible is very, very clear. 
The book of Exodus, for example, reads, If you lend money to one of your poor neighbors among my people, you shall not act like an extortioner, like a Shylock. You shall not act like an extortioner towards him by demanding interest from him, unquote. The Psalms and the prophets confirm this prohibition. King David wrote, quote, Lord, who shall abide in your tabernacle? Who shall dwell on thy holy hill? He that does not ask interest on a loan, unquote. And Ezekiel, the prophet, says, the upright man is law-abiding and honest. He never charges usury on loans, takes no interest, abstains from evil. It is Yahweh who speaks, unquote. From these Bible passages, and I could give you a hundred others, Jews could obviously not be Shylocks to their fellow Jews, and Christians could not act as users to anyone, not even their enemies. In fact, a church council of the 12th century threatened all usurers with not having a Christian burial if they died unrepentant. Now, what exactly, and why exactly, is the sin of usury or seeking profit and gain on a loan condemned by God, the church, and by natural law itself. In short, usury is unjust, for it makes a person pay twice for the same thing. Not only paying back the loan, but paying an additional rental fee, if you will, for the use of the money. Although our financial system has become quite complicated over the years, and yes, twisted and perverted, the nature of money is still pretty much the same. Namely, it's a means of exchange. As scholastics like St. Thomas Aquinas taught in the past, money was like other goods, such as bread or wine. If I went into a pub, for example, and I ordered a beer, the bartender should only charge me for the drink. And since it becomes my beer when I pay for it, he should not charge me for the use of the beer that I already own. In regards to money, the borrower now possesses the money that he has been lent. And in justice, he ought to pay back the loan and make the lender truly whole. But the borrower ought not to be able to add a rental fee, if you will, for the money has already been given. It is not right for the lender to sell and then rent the very same thing. Again, the Holy See condemns usury, saying, quote, the sin rests in the fact that sometimes the creditor desires more than he has given. Therefore, he contends some gain is owed to him beyond that which he loaned. By any gain which exceeds the amount he gave, again, is illicit and usurious, unquote. Now, finally, in the past, Holy Church always encouraged and even sponsored Special non-profit lending houses where usury was never practiced. With that being said, these Christian non-profit lending institutions of the past did have a staff. They did have workers who had salaries, as well as they had to pay insurance policies to protect them if the loans were not paid back. Fees, penalties for late payment, and yes, just compensation due to the effects of inflation meant that the lender was entitled to receive more than was lent in order to be made whole. But such extra payments, even by way of just interest, were always considered outside the loan itself, upon which no profit or gain was allowed. We have seen that the church, in accordance with the many warnings of Scripture, has taught that charging usury on a loan of money is morally wrong. With such a loan, no more can be asked than the return of the lender to his original position. That is making him whole. If there is an investment in something productive, then usury is not present, and sharing in profits and gain are proper. As the church's influence on economic matters in the world has waned, the volatility in the economy has grown. We see over the decades massive upswings and boons, inevitably followed by massive downswings, recessions, and depressions. Usury is always the main cause of any economic collapse. Usury is the root cause of 
business cycles of rapid expansion followed by rapid contraction, of bull and bear markets, and always usury guarantees the concentration of wealth and mammon into the hands of just a few. Usury is the cause of countries, including our own, unable to make payment on their debt. Just catch this for a moment and think. Since 1950, the United States federal government has paid more than $10 trillion in interest using 2017 value of money. $10 trillion in interest alone in just a few decades. It is compound interest that has bankrupted nearly every developed nation in the world and also impoverished nations. Making usury illegal would virtually eliminate all of these evils and would guarantee a wider distribution of ownership in society. The debt would be one-third of its present amount if there were not usury. And furthermore, without usury, money could be used in more productive ways as investment and could produce a just profit. Only when Shylocks are once again despised as they once were, and unjust interest and profit are taken out of the lending process, will sanity and justice return to the field of lending and borrowing. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen.